This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five. Check for sound. Four. It's showtime. Three. Let's two, go. One. You're listening to the Pro Audio Suite, a program for audio and voiceover professionals. Audio suite. Uh, the normal team are here, George, Robert, and Robbo, and myself. And we do have a special guest coming up in this episode. Uh, from London is Des Shaw, who works for Zinc Media, which is a company owned by Bob Geldof. And they don't like Mondays. They, no, they don't like Mondays. No. But who does, let's face it? True. True. Now, Robert, before we got on, you were talking about uh, a plug-in you've always wanted, and you may even score one for free after this. Um, <laughs> Can I have one too, please? <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, well, we were, we were in a uh, sound design team working on some projects. Uh, all the workstations were supposed to have the same plug-in set up so that files could be exchanged easily. And uh, one of the people in the team downloads, installs, and uses um, the speakerphone plugin, and and they print the file into the workstation so that you don't need the plugin anymore. And later on, I'm working with some clients, and I'm working on this file, and they want the sound of this voice coming out of a speaker to change. <laughs> and I look at it, and I'm like, well, <laughs> that's what it is. It's captured. I thought it was captured in the OMF from the editor or even from the shoot. I couldn't tell. Is this some bizarrely named file. And I'm like, I can't change it. And then they're like, well, so-and-so could change it. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and I ended up calling them and said, you know, like, I got this file. What'd you use? I, I use speakerphone. And I'm like, I, I don't have that. We don't have that. We're supposed to work on the same plugin sets. And and then, uh, well, it's a speaker. It's just, it's, a, it's all like EQs and, you know, distortions and filters. And, and you can just recreate it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks what? for that. What? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. So I'm like, okay, great. Thank you for throwing me under the bus. And then, you know, I had to sit there. I didn't have it. And I had to sit there and just do, you know, essentially tell the clients like, well, we can't modify that, but we can start over on our own. So how did you do it? Holy yeah, God. I was going to say, I mean, I was thinking a plugin like that. I'm just thinking intellectualizing what I think a speakerphone sounds like and what you're describing and thinking I could do that, but it probably wasn't as easy as I'm making it think it well, sounds to emulate. Yeah, it's 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 easy to start coming up with stuff that's in that direction. Uh, you know, a high pass, low pass filter, mm. a little bit of distortion, an added delay, you know, put it in very quietly so it sounds like it's bouncing off some wall that's in the environment or whatever, a little maybe even a little bit of reverb. And you can start to approach lots of things. Probably the hardest thing to get is that kind of and, and this one didn't have that. It was just a, it was literally just a speaker. So did you did you actually have the raw voice though? Because it, it didn't come to you already through. Yeah. So we had the raw voice, oh, okay. um, which was found elsewhere in the um, original OMF that came from the editor. Yeah. So I had the clean voice at least. <laughs> you that would have been that, really you? hard to <laughs> take away Un- the one undo speech. and then put yeah. it back. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I had one similar to that. I had this. Uh, uh, I was working on a project and was provided with an OMF, and the it, it was a it was a video diary of someone who was it was doing something from home, and it was recorded on the microphone in their um, in their MacBook. <laughs> oh yes, that yep. familiar. And sound. there was there was a stage where it, part of this the 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 person who was doing the video diary got all depressed and started mumbling under their voice, and it was almost to the point where background noise was louder than the actual audio that we were supposed to, was supposed to be recorded. And I got well, this man. message from the editor: "You can clean that up, can't you?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> okay, yeah. I can I can beat this. You ready? <laughs> Do it. They ask for a freebie on this one. And what it is, is they shoot, edit an entire series of 10 how-to videos. And the person doing the how-to videos had to change costumes and get up. And so they didn't like having to deal with the lav mic. And someone decided it'd be a good idea, because this person's working at a desk, to just put the microphone on the desk. 
Like literally means, just a lav mic awesome. lying directly a lav on mic a hard sitting awesome. on the desk. But it's still like, you know, a good two, three, I don't even know, four feet away because it sure sounded echoey. <laughs> All early reflection, like 95% oh, sh- early reflection. Yeah, there's no, yes. yeah exactly. All quick, <laughs> like tunnel sounding. This is the stuff that does this reverb plugins cannot fix, by the yeah, way, folks. Exactly. Yeah. You cannot, yeah, D reverb is a myth. <laughs> it's D long tail reverb, which right. you can do with a gate, anyways. Right. Um, so basically, that's what happened is they're like, hey, can you clean this up? <laughs> and, uh, and for free, by the way. Oh, for free. Yes. Because you've got so, nothing better to do. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, um, you know, good client. Okay, give us one. We'll see if you like it. They give us one. And basically using a whole crap load of multi-band expanders, you can reduce it at the same time, make them sound like poop. And <laughs> I did that. And it, it didn't necessarily, it made it less reverby. It didn't necessarily improve the sound quality. Um and in fact, in some areas, you know, it's like you start doing that and you have to really watch how it starts overemphasizing S's and things like that. And so we give it to them and we're like, here, this is not perfect, but is it good? And they're like, oh, yes, thank you so much. And then a couple of days later, can you do all 10 of them? <laughs> and we they give must- them all 10. And then a couple of weeks later, because I'm sure at that point they actually decided to play it for their client. They said, mm, can you do any better? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and we were like. <laughs> ADR or reshoot it. Like those are basically your options because, and, and it's it's the second time in my career where I've run into someone literally the 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 other time someone shot with the camera built or the microphone built into the camera because I forgot to switch their input on the camera to the external mic pre that had the lav in it, and the video guys are just like, I see meters moving. I'm right. not even going to bother plugging in a pair of headphones and seeing what this sounds yeah. like. Yeah, and oh, um. Yeah. Same problem there. Well, it's yeah, like a video operator, a pair of headphones. I mean, what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had a, I had an interesting one years ago. This is back in the 80s. And uh, I was in London with a cameraman and we were filming an interview. And uh, it was pissing with rain. So I had an umbrella. But we only had one love mic. That was all we had because normally we had a, uh, a boom. But we were walking, so that was going to be tricky as well. Mm. So we went for the mic, but we had to use share the microphone. But because it was raining, what I did was I put the radio mic, ran the wire up my sleeve, connected it to the uh, the actual uh, stalk of the umbrella, and then you <laughs> used that as the uh, the mic microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like a handheld. Are you a thinker? Using the umbrella, and uh, it worked perfectly. <clears throat> I just moved my wrist a bit when he was talking, moved it back to me when I was talking. <laughs> worked a treat. Great wrist mic. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, the, the, your client, uh, Robert, must have seen the episode of Mythbusters where they polished a turd successfully. <laughs> um, oh, I haven't wow. seen that one. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that. But if they, you uh, polish it hard enough, does it turn to gold? Yeah. Well, they, they, they formed a ball of turd and made it hard, and then they got it so hard that it would polish. And when they were done, they had a shiny oh, turd. ball <laughs> of turd. Wow. So I'm guessing they must have seen that and thought, well, yeah, let's if see Mythbusters what we can, do. can do it, then you guys have that show. Have you seen that in Australia? Uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, the, yeah. The voiceover guy is an Aussie. Oh, oh, really? Is he really? Yeah, well, well, it, it, it's go. funny. He's he's actually, he's English originally, Robert Lee, because uh, he, he came to Australia the same year, because we're the same age. He came to Australia the same year I did, which, funny enough, today... Is my forty fourth anniversary of being in Australia? Ah, happy anniversary! Okay, congrats. congrats! So, um, and he came the same year, and we both went off. He went to work at Two SM, I think, when he was about eighteen, and then I got into radio about two years after that. So we've kind of, but he did live in Canada for a while, and that's why he's got that, you know, Canadian accent. Yeah. Hmm. But well, uh, yeah, the, so we, our I journeys have, have been very similar. Anniversary, myself, my forty fourth anniversary of. Actually, no, not today, but I am 44. So I just thought when I heard the number 44, I thought, that's my 44th trip around the sun. What do you know? <laughs> when was your birthday? Oh, mine's back in October. Oh, okay. 44 and a half. It was mine on Monday. <laughs> mine, I'm, I've done 49 trips around the sun now. I've chosen oh, right, to then. forget how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly <laughs> reminded how old I am. <laughs> Have you guys uh, seen any interesting gear lately? 
Mm. I can tell you a story. Um, tell. We've, uh, we have an interview coming up on our next episode with um, Eric Bazilian from the Hooters. And uh, we'll play a song that's never been heard before. Well, not by the public anyway. Um, but uh, we were talking about with to him about microphones, and he actually has the same microphone that I'm using right now, and it's his favourite microphone. He is a Microtech Gefell nut. In fact, all of his microphones just about are Microtech Gefells, except for, I think, a Coles for overheads on his drums. No kidding. And he got them because the engineer he worked with, with Joan Osborne, um, back in 96, had a studio full of Microtech Gefells, and he got to use them and loved them and never looked back. Oh, that's great. That's my gear story. You find something you love. Yeah, you find something you love. I mean, it's yeah. hard to mess with success, you know? Exactly. Now, I, um, I pull gear out of studios on a regular basis. You know, when I'm going in there to repaint repairs or debug a problem that's been introduced by the latest Microsoft or more often, actually, Apple update and... <laughs> Things now become glitchy and unre- you know very unreliable. And one of those pieces of gear I removed was a Tascam UH7000. And this is a pretty unusual piece of kit for a home or you know for recording. Tascam, I don't know, really think of them as being high-end audio gear. At least I know they've got like a professional line, but I never really thought of them as you know making audio interfaces I would actually want. But I started playing around with it, and then a voice actor coach that uh, that I know fellow um said you know i'm using this thing oh tommy griffiths is his name in case he hears this give him credit and he said i use it and i love it and i also love that i can record the mix and provide playback all using its internal mixer a stunt that's hard to do with a lot of gear out there and um so sure enough i patched it in and he and i did a test one day and it did exactly what he explained and what's interesting about it is a few things one it's built like it's Actual chassis, its industrial design is very like I dare I throw out the word audiophile, but they're going for that made really well, high quality pro, not even beyond pro audio, really more like audiophile grade, where it's it just looks like it's built like a tank. Um, it's got a built in power supply, you know, that you plug the power cord into, no wall wart. It requires the power supply to operate. This is not a thing that will run on USB, so it was never designed to try to drive a preamp or two preamps, phantom power, AD, DA conversion, and headphone amp from 500 milliamps, you know, like most of the other Running USB off of USB, stuff. I know. Right. So this thing has a proper power supply. And it's got two mic inputs, two mic inputs with like 65 dB of gain, I think it is. It might be a little so bit more than that. Much. Pretty good. A really good headphone amp. And if you look this thing up on like gear sluts, you'll see people geek on about this thing for, you know, pages and pages um, because beyond it being a good recording interface, it's, it's a pretty good recording. It's got good preamps. Apparently it's DAC or it's digital analog converters are like world class. Wow. Um, and something about it using Burr Brown op the, amps. Yeah, the, which is AT, uh, not just Texas Instrument, but yeah. Like, yeah, like mic preamps with Burr Brown chips are usually the higher end version of the particular mic. Right, amp. right. That's what it has inside it, and it's it's four hundred US, and they're still making this thing. What's the model? And, um, it's called the UH seven thousand. It's a really definitely an outlier. You know, it's not well marketed at all. Which with nothing, you know, Nat Tascam. Come on, guys, and they they don't seem to be that good at that aspect of business it seems to be um, a piece that they're trying to make like a high-end mic preamp out of yeah so. i mean it's got yeah. lo- dedicated output so you can just use it as a preamp it's got aes in and out that's great so you can mix aes in and out and that's actually why i put it in that particular studio we were using a channel strip we were using a Vorsis m1 channel strip which mm-hmm. has an aes output so i was just looking for something that seemed really reliable is it two channel uh, or go. four channel it's two channels of analog and then your AES can be so mixed So it's four channel, two mix. analog, two digital. Right. Nice. Mm-hmm. And uh, another interesting thing about it is that its mixing interface, the internal monitor mixer, has two different personalities. It has like multi-track mode, and then it has mixer mode. So when you put it in a mixer mode, the internal mixer works like a mixer. And it records whatever the heck is on the mixer bus. So you can record anything coming out of the computer anything coming in from any input, and it'll all just get mixed down and recorded. It just records so the use, mixer. Exactly, yeah. So you can use it like a live recording device to mix 
from several sources. And then likewise, if you've got somebody on Skype or something and you need to give them playback, or if you're on Source Connect now, better off, that'd be a better choice, of course. Um, when you play back, that, that mix will get sent down the line. And I think you have to be a little careful about creating loopbacks, obviously. Sure. Um, you know, creating a mix minus could be a little challenging to keep your mind, your mutes, I guess. But the fact that it can do that, and then also just work in standard multi-track mode where it doesn't do that is really, it's pretty cool. So if you're looking for something a little bit different, built like a tank with incredibly good DAC on board and good headphone amp with gobs of output level and everything. And for $400, it's it's pretty sweet, I'd have to say. So, but Samson, little Samson mixes, have you mucked around with them at all? The 120 you know, MXPs, I, or I think it's MXP, isn't it? MXP124. Yeah, actually, it's so funny. that just I was looking for a USB mixer the, the other day in the store because I had to replace something on the fly at an ad agency. They had a dying Mackie Pro FX USB mixer, which, by the way, I do definitely do not recommend that line from Mackie. It's, um, it's there. We want to compete with Behringer on price product without being as good as Behringer. You product? Uh, so not hang on. Did, did you? Can you repeat that last line again? They're gonna <laughs> they're gonna compete on with Behringer on quality by making it worse. Right. So yeah. I, that's my opinion. The, the Mackie Pro FX is line is below. It's below the VLZ. The VLZ is their is their good quality, and the Aronix is supposedly their pro quality. Yeah. The Pro FX, which I love, any product that says Pro in it, it's okay. Not. Pro Tools aside, <laughs> yeah. Um, is you know some would argue even gonna Pro Tools. Aside. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's it's their crappiest line, and 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 these things don't have a very good uh, lifespan. But anyway, I went to go look for a USB mixer. Ended up leaving the store with a uh, classic Mackie 1202 VLZ4. Can't go wrong. And just using an external USB interface with the mixer because it was better than I thought than the Samsung MXP 124. I don't have a lot of hands on with that mixer, but I have to say. They don't have the most stellar track record in terms of build and sound quality and noise. Um, but you know what? Everything can change. You know, every every brand can redeem. Because I'll tell you, the Behringer digital mixers that they make, which I use one for my show every week, is, I think, fantastic and super reliable. The old Behringers, I know a friend of mine's got a really, really old Behringer preamp. Uh, when mm-hmm. it was made in Germany, and that uh, was right. yeah, uh, that's really nice. I've got nice. a composer compressor, and I remember liking that more than my uh, DBX. I mean, I, actually, like a, a lot of Behringer stuff, the inspiration, I mean, were just Mackie copies, knob for knob, yeah. color for color, and they've yeah. since expanded out and and they and they do their own things, I think. And yeah, once they merged with Midas, or they're <laughs> the all under one Midas. umbrella now, or one company. Yep. <laughs> they're baking in the Midas stuff into their digital boards, the preamps and stuff, and it does. It really does hold up. I have to say, I'm very, I am, am very impressed with what you can get for for the money out of the Behringer digital stuff. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, interesting stuff out there that I I hadn't heard about. Um, just watch your drivers, folks. Just mind your drivers. <laughs> you know, I don't think Tascam is the best driver, solid driver out there. Maybe. On the planet, so just just really be careful when you update systems to make sure that your driver and your and your OS are in lock step with each other. You just got to be very careful of that. In fact, another little story sidebar is I went to a client's house and I did a routine tune up and did a routine OS update, not an upgrade. Just I just went from ten point thirteen point three to point four mm. High Sierra, and classically when you go from point three to point four. It's just making a bunch of little minor bug fixes and under the hood things. Nothing, nothing usually is a big mm-hmm. deal. But in this particular case, it completely broke his external monitor that was hooked to a USB to VGA adapter. So, which should have been a very easy, quick fix, turned into you know a minor fiasco, which took me quite a bit of time to resolve and find a workaround for. Yeah. You know, just because I thought, oh, I'll just do an update. <laughs> so, I know we all know this, but you know, the rule of thumb is if your system is running reliably and it's doing its job don't update anything yeah, yeah. leave it alone exactly. <laughs> lock it down yeah <laughs> now i just checked uh, my the mixer i kind of use my mixer as a i suppose a patch bay really more than anything um but it's a samson mxp 144 mm-hmm. yeah i use a lot, a lot like i use the mackies in a lot of studios where it's really a monitor mix 
system more than it is anything else. Um, but you actually do have it in the signal path when you're tracking. It goes. I do. The signal passes through. Yep, it does. Well, cool. That's a ringing endorsement. Then it means it's pretty clean. It's very clean. I, it, in fact, they claim this is like almost silent. So I, I don't. That's I don't good. hear anything from it. But then again, I'm deaf. So why would I? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't use it for monitoring. It goes out. So the outputs go into the sound card into the computer. And then outputs mm-hmm. from the sound card into a um, a big knob because we all need a big knob once in our life. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. What's yeah, the, I, see? I, what's I think the, big uh, knobs are a place where Mackie failed. Oh really? Absolutely. They they have no slate output and they don't dim the control room when you press the talkback button. It's like ah. go go to control room monitoring section class one hundred and one guys and mm. redesign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, my experience has not been great either. Oh, okay, so what? Because I, I, I've had mine for years, and I just it's there. I mean, um, problem always... with the big knob is that as soon as you got like, if you wanted to use your talkback button to uh, feed into your DAW so that you can slate, send your talkback down something like Source Connect, record a slate from your control room into your DAW, do any of those things, mm. there's no output of that microphone. The only place that microphone goes to in the big knob's mind, is the headphones. So then you got to steal one of your headphone outputs and feed it back into your DAW. Yeah. But no, the headphone output inevitably includes the DAW mix output as well. And then you have a loop. And then you got to go through all kinds of craziness to find out what yep. button's on the front of that thing to defeat the headphone mix from going into that particular headphone output so that you basically dumb it down to just being a talkback slate output. Yeah. So, I've got to say, I yeah, love my so. little Samson C control. Because it does all of the above, and it's brilliant. Yep. I've had it for years, and I if it was balanced, never getting rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> is it not balanced? The seat control is not balanced. No. But besides that, it's a great little. You know, it's like the size of a of a Linksys router. And yeah, yeah. I just yeah. I just use it for yeah. me. It's just for the control room. And but like you say, I can you know, I can send my talk back down the a, a Source Connect connection, or you know, as you say, slate it to tape. I actually my talk back actually turns up on the patch bay. I can send it wherever I want. What what I've been using in, in that to fill that role for voice actors who need it, not that many do, but is the Personas monitor yep. station. Yep. It's like three hundred bucks. Sure. About the same as a big knob. And it has a main bus and a Q bus. And that's how you can you it don't doesn't get have the a slate output, I don't think, out. does it not officially? No, it doesn't yeah. have a dedicated mic's output, but the Q bus can become right. that. Which is the same same kind of trick as the Mackie <clears throat> Big Knob. They probably make it a little less yeah. painful to it's less yeah. painful. <laughs> it, it just kind of works. But it's, it's yeah, it's like an oversight that all these companies um, seem to be missing out on. There was a company called, from a company called, uh, I think it was Here. Here uh, Technologies. H-E-A-R yeah. Technologies. Mm-hmm. They went out of business. And they still no, they still it. make it. They're, they're, they're more known for basically providing, a, I think, an ADAT output from your Pro Tools system with a bunch of mixed stems. And then your musician can play around with their headphone mix on their own without bothering the engineer. That's oh, yeah. kind of their product. Mm-hmm. But they, so, they make remote buttons and things, yeah. So if you were like someone like me, Robert, um, what would you use to, for your monitoring? Source Talkback. No. <laughs> um, what do I... Okay, so... Do you want me to explain? I, I, I have... At, okay, so I, at, at, at the studio, I specifically have a... Um, it's a Martin... What is the name of it now? The one that everyone uses is is the Dangerous, which is, you know, it's very nice, but it doesn't do surround. And so that's the reason why I didn't go with the Dangerous. And it's also a little bit expensive. So I got a Martin Multimax, and that handles a whole bunch of, a lot of stuff, because really the Multimax was designed to take a board and turn it into a surround sound board, even though it was only a stereo board. Um, so it has all these, like, folding down, and it can do all kinds of stuff, but... For us, the main point is it's a 5.1 volume knob. Um, we used to use a, for sh- a short amount of time, we used two things. We used a Dolby 650, which was a overkill, but that was a decent surround volume knob. And then we had also a, stu- not Studio Projects, is it Studio Projects? They make the M-Patch. Who's, who's the company that makes the M-Patch? Oh, it's called SP, but... I don't think, it, yeah, it might have been Studio Projects. The worst mm-hmm. box ever made. It's all passive. Yes. Yeah, it's all passive. I know that much. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
You can spend a lot of money on this stuff. This is why we made Source VC actually, because so my exact experience was like, okay, we need a 5.1 volume knob. The least expensive one was the the M patch, and it was horrible. It mm-hmm. never went down to absolute zero. It was clicky and intermittent, and you'd turn to one volume, and you'd have four speakers, and you'd flip it back and forth, and you get six, and then you go down one, and you have no center channel, and so basically, that's a little bit where the inspiration for um, Source VC came from, which is just a plug-in you throw in Pro Tools, and now you can control your monitors with your keyboard. You can control it with your iPhone or any MIDI controller. You combine that with Source Talkback, and it sort of builds your own monitor control section. And the reason why I liked that a lot was because I find myself going between Pro Tools systems, and if the whole thing is agnostic of any external hardware then you can really open and close files and do what you need to do from almost anywhere. You know, jumping from a laptop that has two ins and two outs, and then later opening it up on a system that's got 16 ins and 16 outs because all the patching and everything is completely inside of Pro Tools and there is no external stuff to worry about except for where's my headphones, where's my microphone, where's my talkback input. Those those are the three yeah. things. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, it... Grace came out with a new one called the M. They've made monitor controllers for a while now. They make one called the M908 coming out soon so that you can support 22 by 2 or 22.2 surround sound. Yeah. It has 24 channels. Yeah, exactly. Of audio that it can control, you know. And uh, their stuff is ca- the Cadillac of monitor controllers but, for but sure. The, but the crazy Probably thing overkill. about that is that you need 22 outputs of your workstation. And then, and then you got to con- right. continue that out. Um, I mean, I I know you need 22 outputs for your speakers, but um, man, we we had setups in other studios I used to use that was like everything was like all going to an analog patch bay and everything you wanted to do, and it was just like such a, right. a bloated and oversized system. And these days, a lot of yeah. the time, you just don't need all that. You, like you can have everything yeah. very much internal. Yeah, and that's true. I like your argument for the moving between workstations seamlessly, easily. Yeah, makes yeah. a lot of sense. But I've I've used the 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 multi max is just wonderful as far as an actual volume knob, um, and and it's in handling small speakers. Like it has a system for small surround speakers, which is pretty cool. Um, the dangerous is definitely top of the line and nice. Uh, what else have I used? The controller in my Control Twenty Four. I've used that a lot. <laughs> it's got a slate output. Oh, yeah. And the Xmons from Pro Tools or Avid with their D command series. Um, but inexpensive ones, I guess not a lot of experience with those. The C- mm. M patch is the main one. Yeah. Well, you asked. I did earlier. ask. And because uh, I often look, <laughs> yes, I look at my thing and I kind of think, um, is that me or is that somebody else? That's my reminder that we have a interview going on right now. Ah. Uh, Good, because it sounds like mine. <laughs> something arriving. Actually, it's Andy. in 10 minutes. Ah, <laughs> good. Well, good job we had a warm-up before we start. So I run everything through from, you know, the mics into the preamps and wherever, compressors, whatever. Then they all go into the Samson. Also going to the Samson is the ISDN box, is the phone patch. The laptop goes in there if I want to use Skype. And uh, and then Source Connect is actually standalone. Sits on on the computer itself. On the you know, right. so then everything comes out there, goes into the sound card through the computer, and then the output from the computer goes into the big knob, which I use for monitoring. Does ah, that make so sense? You, is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, and uh, George, I'm not too sure how you do this, but a lot of people would take that computer and return it back to the Samsung, but just keep the buses separate because the Samsung also has a volume section for a control room. Uh, yes, it does. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Yes, it would have. What features in the big knob do you use besides the big knob? If that's it. I just use that to um, monitor. Uh, so you don't use the, the second headphones. headphones. Oh, output. Way. You don't use the talkback input. Um, I run the headphone output, which goes into the into the wall of the booth, then breaks off into here, and then I've got, a, in fact, a little a headphone amp, which has four channels. So I use, well, I'm only using one at the moment, but uh, when I had two setups in, in the booth, I... I had two sets of headphones in there. Do, um, do you use the um, like the speaker selectors, the outputs on the speaker selectors to change? I've just got one set of speakers. That's it. I th- well, good I news think you for could you, sir. The whole big if job. that thing ever dies, yeah. or I should say, yep. when it dies, you don't need it. they make a very simple two-channel passive version of the big yep. knob. 
it's like 80 bucks or 60 bucks. Um, yeah, it's totally passive and it's just basically a big they, knob with a prop. They make even less expensive um, versions like that. I think ART just makes literally an XLR in, XLR out. Like it's just a volume pot yep. for whatever you want to put through it. There's a bunch of them and I've used them all. And there's a reason. I have a voice actor client. His name will, he will rename yep. nameless in our uh, podcast. Has a very curious uh, habit of using a volume knob on his board to control his headphone volume dynamically while he's voice acting. Wow. So he's turning up his cans basically at the end of each phrase then turning them back down again when he starts speaking extremely rapidly. When you look at his hand, he looks like a DJ scratching a yep. record. So he's like the human That's compressor. That's how fast his hand's moving. He's a human headphone compressor because he wants to hear the tail end of every word. He wants to hear the end of the syllable, the everything clearly in his head. Why doesn't he just smack it's a the, big compressor on his monitors? It's the craziest thing I've, I've ever really seen. Um, he's been doing it that way for many years. So we have gone through more headphone volume controllers than you can yeah, shake sure. a stick at. I mean, we've tried a lot of stuff because he wears them out. We've, we've really used every single standalone XLR in and out volume knob there is out there. Um, and it's interesting. I, think, I think what you should get is a guitarist's volume pedal. <laughs> I tried that. It doesn't matter because the yeah. pots inside, the problem is the pots, they all wear out. They can't handle it. Isn't that funny though? You know, they just don't, don't you find that interesting, yeah. like in a performance point of view, that he's so interested in every single syllable at the end of every word that he's spending time, you know, fixating on that as opposed to just reading the script and not worrying about that until afterwards. And if there's something weird, I find that odd. I think his focus is in the wrong, in the wrong place. Spot. Yeah, not point. Yeah. yeah, you concentrate on the performance when you're concentrating yeah. on that. That that's weird to me. So, so Andrew, I think that you could, except for the overall size of the knob, I think that your big knob is redundant to the uh, Samsung that inevitably has a control room knob on it. He likes the big knob. Yay, it's come on. The, he likes to have a big knob. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. It is a size It's the thing. only one he'll ever have. Let him have it. <laughs> it is a size thing. Well, I'll, I'll, it's let, done me, let, job. Me put a, uh, let me put a period on this monitor knob thing. With So the client had in question, we wanted to find the perfect volume knob. And he saw a volume knob on a 60s or 70s piece of gear. with One of those big Bakelite knobs yep. from like yep. an on-air console. And, um, well, I found some on eBay, bought the knobs. And then I uh, installed the knob on a Palmer volume pot, con volume controller that I found online. It's called Palmer. I think it's a hundred bucks. And um, it's the only one he hasn't worn out yet. And instead of using the knob it came with, we're using this cool Bakelite knob. <laughs> and it's the coolest text, you know, it's a very tech tactile thing, but he loves it. And what's ironic now is he's training himself to not do it anymore, which <laughs> Cracks me up go. because right. I spent five freaking years at least trying to find them the best volume knob. Well, you want to turn it around, George. You want to, you know, make those commercially now. Yeah, yeah. Sell them. Oh, it's crazy. It's so funny. I like anyway. that with a big, big bake light knob. That's great. I mean, yeah. it's, little, it's the little things, especially when you have a home voice actor studio. You're a single voice. You have a single mic, single person, and you know you don't have you don't need a lot of gear, right? So what you do have, you want it to be really interesting and something that's fun to use after a while, I guess. I mean, it's just kind of neat to have something that's a little different and unique, you know. So I get I get that desire to to try to do something like that. And he has me on a monthly retainer. I go to his studio every month. So every month I'll be doing some very important yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My dad one time got in a car accident and uh he ended up in the oncoming lane and it was because of slick ice and there was no one around and the cop. Apparently in the state, the law was that accidents don't happen, they're caused. So therefore, for any accident, there must be a ticket. And my dad ends up in the situation brainstorming with this cop about what could the ticket be? And they finally came up with failure to keep right. <laughs> and that was it. There you go. Yeah, it's like, help the cop write you a ticket. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What can you charge me with? Yeah. <laughs> That's bizarre. Yep. Yeah, very strange. Well, I love this. Sh I love this show because we go on tangents, and nobody starts <laughs> complaining. We just go with it. You got to go with. I don't it. know like if a, you guys, like a Billy Connolly, the people that listen to the show. I mean, I, I would love to get your feedback. I, I haven't. Do we get feedback? Do people listen to this thing anyway? 
I've had a couple of death threats. <laughs> Have you had any death threats? I've had a couple. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are there actually people listening to this? I would, I would love to find out. I mean, we, we have an email address, don't we? How do people let us know if they like the show or not? Facebook? Yeah, uh, it's info at... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I haven't checked the email recently. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we point everyone to our Facebook? Uh, our Facebook oh, is Facebook just, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what, so the Facebook is the Pro Audio Suite Podcast. So if, you've got, if you want to give us some feedback, like um, maybe you're the guy that fired a nail gun into my rear tire. I don't know. Maybe you'd like to leave <laughs> us a message on Facebook. Feedback um, or pushback. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or right. actually, if anyone's got any questions, you know, because I'm yeah. sure people are sitting there scratching their head looking at something. I mean, maybe even like we've what just is it, talked like about. Stump the chump? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> go to some some yeah. like elevator music. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we can go to the interview. How about that? We should go to the interview. We that should put you to sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope not. So but how are we going to get to the interview? Oh, we're there. We're there. We're at the interview. Yeah, I think we just did it, didn't we? <laughs> no, we haven't got there yet. Here we go. And uh, we're ready for the interview, I think, because we've run out of the things to talk about for the moment. Uh, the interview this week is with a chap that uh, Robbo and I worked with many years ago in Perth. Um, he ended up moving to the UK, works with Bob Geldof, his company called Zinc Media. Um, and he's in charge of basically producing some pretty amazing um, specials. And uh, in this interview, we talk about some of the incredible people he's sat down and had a good old chin wag with. Uh, one in particular was um, David Bowie. So let's wow. cross to London to Des Shaw. Andrew, how are you? I'm oh, very well. Very <laughs> well indeed. Now, it has been a long time since we've actually... The last time I saw you, I think, was in London about 11 years ago. <laughs> Glad to. And we had lunch. Score. We did, yeah. indeed. Well, I, I gauge it on my child because she wasn't two then, <laughs> oh, and okay. uh, now she's thirteen. So I'm going to go. Okay, well, you know, oh. take two from thirteen. You got eleven. I thought you were going to give us some great rock and roll secret that you had some love child no. together or something. <laughs> no, it's just his maths. Yeah, just his right. maths. See, I've still got it. I've still got it. Um, now we all worked together at one point um, in Perth. I'm not sure if we all three of us were in the same building at the same time though. Yeah, we were. Yeah, your office was next Did door to mine and Des was on the other side of mine. If you oh. can't remember, then it must have been true. No, I was going to say, that's <laughs> right. good. <laughs> Back in those days. <laughs> the drugs yeah, were purer. <laughs> they were. And in an abundance as well, if my memory serves me correctly. <laughs> but uh, they were the days in uh, radio in Perth. And an interesting um, thing happened in Perth. Mm. And you, you can give me the full story, Des, but um, it involved Bob Geldof. And you did an interview with him and you got into a discussion about programming radio stations and he basically said to you, I could do a better job or something like that. Is that correct? What happened was he had uh, free reign to play whatever he wanted to play and he did a fantastic sweep of music where he went from Patsy Cline to The Clash and explained how Joe Strummer was deeply influenced by Patsy Cline and all that music at the time, Woody Guthrie and so on. In fact, when Joe Strummer first started playing music, he was actually playing country music, uh, and he used uh, the pseudonym Woody because he was a huge fan of Woody Guthrie. Anyway, he was a massive fan, and country music deeply inspired what The Clash were doing. So Geldof's explanation of how he got from Patsy Cline playing this musical link through to London Calling The Clash, I thought was riveting. So he got in touch and said, do you want to do that on a more detailed basis, do it for a couple of hours a day, and do it down here in sunny Australia and escape from the boring, freezing cold London of February, and do it down here? And he said, that's a great idea, as long as I can play anything I want to play. And at that time, um, we had the luxury of having very high ratings, so we could afford to take a bit of a punt. So we said, yes, let's do it. So Back in the days when they had wonderful Contra, we arranged to get him and his family down to Perth and he spent that week on air and loved it and then brought the band down afterwards and then started a tour. So the combination of being able to play his favourite music and loving every minute of it and having the freedom to do so while Paul and the kids sat at Observation City, as it was back in the days, by the beach, uh, was great. So he, he loved it. We all loved it and it was hugely successful. 
And he came back every year for about four or five years, I think. He then came back regularly for quite a long time, yeah. The last time he was there was 93, March 93, when um, McCartney came in, was during the McCartney tour. So McCartney was one of his guests, because he was able to back in those days, um, just make a few phone calls to his mates and had some great guests, Bono at one point. But McCartney was, was a fantastic one because he actually came into the studio that day. Yeah. And there was mayhem for two hours, which was fascinating, and uh, recorded an amazing interview. And so that was, yeah, 93. Yeah, I do remember that interview because at one point um, McCartney was saying things like, oh, you know, I just don't write songs the way I used to and all this kind of stuff. And Gerloff was saying, come on, you know, you write great songs. And then Linda rang, uh, went, got on the switchboard and uh, got to put it to air. And then she was joined, joined the conversation saying to Bob, good on you, you know, tell Paul, tell Paul. I've been telling him that he, he still writes great songs. Yeah, he did, uh, yeah. and Geldof was, was actually lifting quotes from songs. He, even Blackbird, he just quoted the lines from Blackbird and said, anybody who's 21 years of age and can write a line like that um, is up there with the greats and will be remembered for in memoriam uh, as one of the great composers of all time because Paul uh, has, has always sort of st struggled a little bit with um, trying to find his place and uh, it was great that Bob was able to say, look, this is, this is the fact about you and your songwriting. It's the incomparable and you'll be... You go down in history as one of the great legends. It was a fascinating interview, and you're right. Linda joined in. And I, I was surprised that he actually did, he was quite insecure about his work. Apparently, uh, what you read about them all, um, John was as well. John was incredibly insecure. So I think most artists you'll find if you spoke to them all, they do struggle. Uh, there's a lot of times you read and you hear them in, in conversation talking about how they're not sure how they got to where they are, and they're all afraid that one day they're going to wake up and realize that it was all a bad dream and it'll all come crashing down around them. So it doesn't matter what your creative spark is, whether you're an actor, singer, songwriter, whatever, I'm sure they all have doubts somewhere. Well, the imposter syndrome. As you say, the imposter syndrome, because they're all scared that one day they're going to wake up and people are going to realise they've been faking it. It's like, you yeah. don't really deserve to be here. So, yeah. 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 Which is why they then struggle. So it's the great, it's the great ones who come out of that and continue to, to do fantastic work. But I think we all suffer from imposter syndrome. I'm sure you do, Des, deep down. You must be waiting for someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, you don't really know what you're doing, do you? And you go, no, I don't. I've, I've always lived by the mantra, fake it to make it. Yeah. Well, we should actually, yeah, yeah. We should actually go there because we haven't done that yet. Um, tell us what you do every day, Des. I fake it every day. <laughs> no, we're talking out, we're to, actually, outside of the bedroom. <laughs> You've heard about um, Brian Eno's fantastic box of cards that he has that he gives to everybody when he works on a project. And one of the great cards in that set is, is one that actually says, fake it. And I actually have that framed <laughs> sitting in front of me as I speak. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so what do you do, Des? <laughs> so I produce radio and television programs. Um, I've been here for... 22 years now. What happened with, as you said, Geldof would come down to 96 FM in Perth um, most summers. And the, while he was there, he got to see what the station was doing and got to hear what the station was doing and then traveled the world. And we had long conversations about what was happening in media at the time. And he was particularly taken by what was happening with the zoo formats around the world, how people were doing and had the ability to do a lot of free form. And he took that into television in London, uh, his company, production company, Planet 24, produced a program called The Big Breakfast, which was very, very free form and was a great starting platform for a lot of people that went on to become extremely famous uh, in the UK. And they had access to a lot of fantastic names. So, for example, they would do interviews. Paula would have a 15, 20-minute interview with someone incredibly famous, an A-lister. They would use five minutes of that on TV, and that was it. And I said to Bob, what are you doing with the audio? Uh, and he said, nothing. Why? And at that time, the whole cult of celebrity was just starting to begin and people were having the discussion internationally about whether entertainment news should be part of genuine news. And traditional journalists were saying, we don't want to hear the latest coming and going about Madonna or anybody. This should be genuine hardcore news. And that was just when, in the early 90s, when that discussion started to happen. And I said to them, what are you doing with all that material? And they said, nothing, it's sitting in a library. And I suggested, well, you can turn that into radio audio and you could... Um, then internationally sell that quite easily because radio stations all around the world would love to have Sting, Pete Townsend, Sylvester Stallone, all these people, Arnold Schwarzenegger as part of their entertainment news on a daily basis. So they said, why don't you come over here and see what you can do with the archive, which is what I did. And at the same time, Geldof had seen Sky Show in Perth and said, that's a fantastic concept because as we know, that had radio, television and press with it. So we had a plan that was in 95 to start to do those around Europe with an aim of getting the Millennium Show in London. So that's what we did. So in 96, we did uh, Dublin and 
then went on to do Cardiff and Cork and a couple of other places and then got the contract to do all the millennium celebrations across London on New Year's Eve, particularly the fireworks down the, the middle of the Thames. So we basically used the Sky Show concept and uh, used it here successfully. So from then, we then went on and formed a, another company. And so we've just spent the last 20 years making TV and radio programs. Wow, that's pretty impressive. So now, because I've, I've heard some of the, the radio shows you've done, um, and you spend a lot of, you're actually quite hands-on getting to the talent and interviewing the talent. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, it's like anything in media these days, it's all pretty much a one-man band. We've, uh, the whole company, and this last count, the company started off as Planet 24 Radio, they then turned into... Um, 10 Alps, and then it changed to Zinc Media and the company that we started now, it's got something like 350 employees, but most people still do it single-handedly. They don't have PAs or anything, and, and that's one of the things we've always focused on. Even the CEO never had a PA, he did it all himself. So we've always done it firsthand and using the, the least amount of people possible. So a lot of what we do is, it's, it's, yeah, it's basically me and an editor, and we do all the interviews, all the research, put it all together, and it's very, very hands-on. That way we have total control at all times. We know exactly what's happening at any stage of the process. So it has been fascinating, and that's exactly how we work, yeah. Who's been the most interesting person you've had to interview, do you reckon? David Bowie oh. was fascinating. Uh, we did a program about the history of the Marquee Club, which was, for those that, that don't know, in the, in the middle of London in, in the 60s, was the place to be, as Bowie said at the time. It was the heartbeat of British rock and roll. It started as a jazz club and then turned into an R&B club. It's where all the jazz guys, when they took a break, the R&B guys would step up on stage and do a couple of songs. Um, and it's where the Rolling Stones started and people like that. And Bowie loved the Marquee because he was very experimental. He tried all these different characters because he was just this magpie who collected all these different characters. He was desperate. As I was talking to someone the other day, Tony DeFries, who was his original manager, he said that all Bowie wanted to do when he first started was there was a fantastic, really outrageous nightclub in London called The Sombrero. And all David Bowie wanted to do was walk down the stairs into the basement of The Sombrero and everybody take a deep breath when he walked in. That's all he was interested in because he wanted to be famous. And he tried everything. He tried mime and poetry and music and everything. And the marquee was where he tried all these fantastic personas that he um, enveloped. And uh, we did a program about the history of the marquee. And David said, yeah, I've got everything I ever did in the marquee. I love it. So I can tell you everything that I did across a whole uh, span of different personas, different eras that were failures, some of them, but successes others. So he had uh, a studio in New York and he went through and kept all of the, the um, tickets that they had, all the posters, everything that reminded him of the marquee. And so he went into Philip Glass's studio um, in the centre of uh, New York and sat down for hours and he went through everything that he did from early 1962 all the way through all the bands, the lower third, King Bees, everything, and talked about what he, he did in those days. And what we used on the radio was fascinating, but what he said off air <laughs> was even more interesting because we just sat there and let the tape roll and he was absolutely, yeah, ex loved it and was completely in control of everything that he did at the time. He remembered what he was wearing, who he was with, what he played with, so that was very interesting. But there been a lot of them. Johnny Depp did a program about James Dean for us because he was a massive James Dean fan. So he said, yeah, I'd love to do that. So he sat down and just talked about how important James Dean was to him. And that was also a fascinating discussion done in his, his office in Los Angeles. Susan Sarandon did a great program about John Lennon because she loved Lennon. Uh, Antonio Banderas did one for me on Che Guevara. Um, Jerry Hall did a couple of series for us. So there's been lots of people that we've worked with. Most recently, Tony Visconti went back and revisited Heroes in Berlin 40 years ago, and Florence Welsh presented a program with Tony on his recollections of being in Hunter Studios in Berlin with Bowie and Eno um, doing, and Iggy Pop in particular, doing Heroes. So we're very, very lucky to work with lots of fantastic contributors who are more than happy to tell their story on, on television or on radio. Now, Tony Visconti, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, is a very well-known American um, recording engineer and producer who did things like T-Rex in the early days and various other English bands. But someone was telling me the, only recently that um, he's a bit bitter about some of the things that happened during, or during and after some of those um, sessions. He f um, he from what I gather, he felt that he was ripped off. <laughs> He's a fantastic guy. The good thing about, uh, I've found in the programs we've done over the years, the good thing about engineers and technicians, and I know you did, what, did one with Richard Lush, for example. I worked with Richard when we re-recorded Sgt. Peppers for a 40th anniversary. Those guys are fantastic examples of the most successful ones had a job to do. 
So they didn't overindulge in the drink and the drugs at the time. So their memory is much better than some of those who are actually participating in the projects. And Tony is one of those lovely guys who remembers everything. And because he started out as a musician, he knows exactly what the musicians were going through. So you rightly say he walked into a club, a basement club in London, and there was this folk band sitting cross-legged on uh, the carpet, one playing bongos and one playing guitar, acoustic guitar. And they're doing all this airy-fairy hippie folk stuff. And that was Mark Bolan. And they then became Tyrannosaurus Rex. And Tony did the first five or six T-Rex albums. And so he was there during the transformation that Mark went through from being a long-haired hippie into this glam rock god. Uh, so Tony recollects those days very clearly. At the same time, he also started to work with Bowie. So he's, he's this amazing, amazing source of what happened during that period, the whole birth of glam, the conflict between Bolin and Bowie, and then what happened after that and the acts that he's worked with since then. It's just this massive long list of some of the most influential people in the world. So he's great. But, but I, the conversations I've had with him, he is very aware of his part in history. The thing that occasionally he gets annoyed about is the Bowie period when they did the whole Berlin trilogy, as it's called, Brian Eno gets credited a lot with being the producer, and he wasn't. Brian Eno was part of the process, but Tony Visconti was the producer. So the only time Tony has said, can we try and just set the record straight here? And, and, and Brian Eno has actually said it. He said in many interviews that, that Tony doesn't get the credit he deserves, especially for heroes. Um, but that's the one thing that, that Tony was a little bit not upset about, but just would like to set the record straight over all the years is the important part that he played in the producer as all, all those projects with Bowie and not the not Brian Eno. He also inspired a lyric in the uh, song Heroes uh, because he, he had a girlfriend. He was kissing his girlfriend out by the wall. Exactly right, um, because he was married at the time to Mary Hopkins, and so he was um, playing the field, and he, as he said, he was, they were indulging in the delights of Berlin. Berlin. Berlin in 1977 was this amazing city that was so vibrant, and it was just the epicenter of Bohemia. Everybody there was indulging in everything as much as they could. The city was extremely cheap to live because the whole political situation, which is why Bowie went there. And so he, yeah, he was enjoying the, the delights of the backup singer, Antonio Mass, and exactly that. Bowie, they put the whole song together quite quickly. And then David said, I need to finish some of these lyrics. So why don't you go off and give me a break for a while? So they all went for a walk outside and that's exactly what happened. They're walking along the side of the wall, stopped for a kiss and David Bowie saw him out of the control room window. And that is exactly how the lyric came to be. Yeah, fascinating story. <laughs> Mary Hopkins, yes. uh, those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. <laughs> so when you, uh, when you record and you go into the edit, you're obviously, yep. um, you go in with all the material, you sit down with an audio engineer. Do you, have you got your own setup in London? Is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. And, and we record different ways. So, for example, if we're able to get face-to-face -face with someone, that's great. So, for example, Bowie, we go in as a, to, to Philip Glass's studio in New York and record. If we can't, we'll take our recording gear into their office or a hotel room. We've become masters at setting up voiceover booths in hotel rooms where you take all the blankets off the bed, you fold up pillows, you get the cushions off the chairs, and you create a voiceover booth uh, where you can do other bits and pieces and um, fake it in a studio. And yep. so we do that. If we can't, we'll go down the line. There are any number of ways of doing that these days. Most recently, we did a fantastic program with Angeline Jolie because uh, she wanted to make a program about Louis Zamberini, who wrote the book Unbroken, and she then turned that into a film. So we did a program about Louis, and she was filming at the time, so she couldn't get into a studio. She was stuck in an island uh, off of Cyprus. And so we were able to get an internet connection, and her engineers that end did exactly that. They set up the room to make it uh, as ambient as possible. We did the same thing this end, which we then edited afterwards. So we do in a number of ways. Other, other ways I've also done we'll send someone in to record their end of a phone conversation. So we'll just tape sync it. So I'll chat to them on the phone. The guy at the other end will record their answers. And then in the old days, they'd fly it back. We jump on a plane with the, with the tape and bring the DAT or the mini disc back. These days, we just send the MP3 file or whatever and email it. That, we do that a lot because it makes it cheaper and easier to get to someone. So you just hook up by the phone and then they email us the audio. So we then match that into what we've got here. And it sounds like we're this, using the same technology both ends of the conversation. Well, that's back to what we're doing right now. Pure genius, really, now. isn't it? Yes. Pure genius. Yes. Do you remember the days when you have to go and take a tape recorder down to a hotel room, a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and then do the interview and go back and cut it up with a, with a, a razor blade? And then you'd forget, when you got back to the studio, you realised you forgot to press record. <laughs> yeah. But going up with cassettes, you remember the, the sort of, you know, industry standard cassettes? 
Yeah. We used to go well, it's interesting movies. because that, that conversation came up with Tony Visconti when we did the, the Heroes program. It was presented by Florence Welsh, and they were talking about, he was describing how he edited Heroes, the original long version, and was talking what he was doing, mentioning the razor blade, and, and Florence said, what do you mean? And she's of the generation that do everything on laptops, as you know, and she thought he was joking. She had no idea that that's exactly how it's done. She's never seen it. Wow. Never seen a block and anyone using tape or, or a razor blade in the studio. Uh, and I thought that was just incredible, the fact that um, everything these days, you just do not find a studio where there's an old reel-to-reel machine except some of the old BBC studios. But the fact that it's gone from yeah, reel-to-reel to, to what you can do digitally these days in such a short space of time is, is quite amazing. But yeah, she and Tony had a great conversation about him describing what they did with the razor blade edits and the fact that he was playing around with a master. That was it. You only had one chance to get it right and all the sort of the tape on the floor was then picked up and either thrown in the bin or stuck in a box somewhere. But it was up to him to make sure that he got that edit right uh, or else he ruined everything. I've often thought it would be a we, challenge to get like a, a good challenge to get like a Bruno Mars or a, you know, one of the, the contemporary sort of artists of today and stick him in a studio with a 16 track or even an eight track and go, right, here you go. <laughs> See what you can get out of that little baby. That's exactly what we did for the Sergeant Pepper's 40th anniversary. We got um, Jeff Emmerich and Richard Lush, who engineered and teched the uh, Sergeant Pepper's recording back in 1967. We took them back into Abbey Road Studios and we took back the original analog four track mixing desk wow and uh what one of them had been bought by lenny kravitz was in his studio in new york so we had to fly that one back into the studio so we then brought in 13 bands and each of them we said right okay here's your you've got to record exactly as the beatles did back in the day and each band chose a song to do from the album and a lot of the bands the younger ones who were only used to working on laptops and using pro tools really struggled some of the old ones, Brian Adams, who has been around for years, was able to nail his part, but some of the, the younger bands really struggled and it made a fascinating TV and radio documentary as these guys, first of all, walked into the studio and said, what's that? And Jeff <laughs> said, that's the original four-track analog mixing desk and here's these big knobs and everything and they, they'd never seen one, so they, had, they were fascinated to see how it worked. And the fact that we were recording exactly as the Beatles did, so, for example, they, they did very few overdubs. If they made a mistake, they had to go back and start again. These bands didn't get that because these days you go into the studio, you record and then you leave it to the engineer and the producer to then take whichever bits and pieces and nail it all together. So the fact they had to keep stopping and starting again um, became, it was fascinating because it became really frustrating for them because uh, every time there was a mistake, Jeff would go, no, you've got to stop and do it again. And I'm going, hang on a second. So some of them took days to do it. They eventually got there, but it was fascinating to just to see how these young bands were, were looking at this analog material and then how they used it. And some of the bands, because of that, then went and recorded their next album using analog material because they, were, they, they thought that the way they recorded in the studio was fascinating. And it gave them that unified playing together as a group and the pressure to perform to make sure you got it right um, and added an extra factor to the whole recording and made it quite interesting. So the warmth you got from the analog tape for the sound was one thing, but also the fact that you were forcing the band to play together as a unit was also something they found fascinating. So it was a really, really interesting project wow. to do. Wow, that's cool. You actually sent me a photograph um, when you were doing that of Paul Weller and uh, Noel Gallagher and they, I could see that they were just like standing there, arms crossed, you could see on their faces like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah, that was in Abbey Road Studios and they did the Oasis decided to do Within You Without You, which was the opening sac- track aside too, which most people thought was an in- interesting choice for Oasis because they, they thought it would have gone for Lucy in the Sky, one of the obvious ones because they were such massive Beatles fans. But it was actually Liam who insisted on doing Within You Without You. He said, no, I want to do that and give it a shot because it's completely different to what we'd expect. So back in the days when he and Noel were still talking, they went into the studio and uh, they worked out an arrangement and then they played it and it sounded amazing and that was exactly that. It invited Paul Weller, who's a mate and a huge Beatles fan when he found out what they were doing he said I must come down and have a listen to this so that shot was them sitting at the mixing desk with with Richard Lush and with Jeff Emmerich and and uh, Paul was listening into with, with Noel what was happening and they're just having a, a listen to the original and then working out the difference to the version they played so that was fascinating because it was in studio at the control room at studio two at Abbey Road all those years later with that original mix, mixing desk back in situ it's incredible it was great you know why Liam and Noel don't talk anymore <laughs> Go on. <laughs> because they've used all the words they know. They've run out. <laughs> Boomtish. Uh, hello, yeah, Liam and Noel, you if you're listening. to interview them again. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, Des, just blown your career there. Um, <laughs> we did another program we did was about the recording of Wonderwall, and it was fascinating to talk to the producers and engineers at the time because uh, they were divulging some of the secrets that Noel was using to write some of the songs which involved adaptations of Beatles. I won't say any more. 
Well, that was kind of obvious, really, wasn't it? And tapes played it? backwards. Tapes played backwards. Well, it was like, you know, the jam with Start. You know, that, that yeah. was just Taxman. Yeah. With new lyrics. That's, that's all that was. It's the same bloody song. So. Oh, Jesus, I'm getting out here now. That's it. That's... <laughs> so who else is involved with your part of the production? Is it just you or is anybody else, you know, like it? Any other crew that the, get involved? The, the, we've got a bunch of people that do, as I say, radio and TV programs. So everyone brings in teams as they need them. So the editor that I've used all the time for 20 years, a fantastic guy called Chris O'Shaughnessy, who's won many, many awards based on, on the programs that he has done over the years. He's the technical genius that puts it all together. So once I've gathered all this information together, um, then he and I sit down and piece it all together. And he works the same. There are a number of us that do these projects without the company. So who'll work with anybody who needs him at the time? So whoever's got a project at the time schedules him in for a certain amount of time in the studio. Um, and then he'll do these projects, whether it's for BBC or commercial operators or what. We all have access to him. We don't have to use him exclusively, but t those of us in the company that choose to tend to because he's so very good at it. So we've got a whole host of people who are doing these programs all over the place, working on different formats. Some of them political, some classical music i just tend to do the ones that mostly the the popular ones because i can fake it better <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> absolutely now we were talking before because obviously this is a podcast um your stuff historically has been for like the bbc or european broadcasters so what how do you feel about podcasting are you doing versions for for a podcast of these shows yes um the BBC has always done podcasts to their programs anyway, and we have started in the last, as you've seen, this huge explosion in podcasts around the world. We're, we're working on a couple of projects now um, uh, for people who will be either doing them privately or those who will be doing them commercially. But the problem you've got, of course, if you do anything to do with music is rights, because it's very difficult to get permission to use commercial music for anything more than a, 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 an online 30-day presence for any commercial or BBC operators. You can't do anything more than that. And podcasts, obviously, as we all know, work best if you can get access to them um, in memoriam. So if you just meet, make sure that they're up there forever so people can access them all the time. So there's a, tricky, there's a tricky area at the moment for people to source rights and payments for all the relevant organisations to make sure that you obviously do it legally. Well, it's interesting because uh, my neighbour, we actually... Um and his girlfriend, who co-produced a, a documentary film recently, um, which was about uh, an aerial skier, Lydia Lussela, the Australian aerial skier. And the hoops and the money and all the nightmare situations they went through just to get rights to show some Olympic footage was unbelievable. So I'm sure you've come across things like that too, where you go, okay, we just done this thing on Bowie, it's going to be great. And it's like, uh, no, but you can't play any music and you can't show any videos unless you pay us a squillion That's dollars. It's exactly how it works. And we, I just did a film recently with Bruce Springsteen and he was good because he gave us rights to all his material, uh, interviews, but we wanted to use some of the footage he did from halftime at the Super Bowl. So we had to go through that process exactly with the NFL to make sure we got permission to use the, the, the footage and paid for it. And some of those people can be quite expensive. Some can be quite reasonable. Some artists, they will just say, no, you can use that. That's fine if it's only a short Others have got managers who step in and say, no, I want to make sure that we get paid an awful lot. And the Bowie thing you mentioned is true. There are a lot of people around the world who've got some great footage of Bowie that he wasn't able to acquire the rights to. And if you want to try and use those, then they can be sometimes $20,000 for 30 seconds, people are asking, which is why there are lots of great stories from Bowie's career that have never been told because those rights holders are holding out for the big bucks. So there are any number of great stories from the early 70s in particular. At the time, it was quite easy to get stuff made because you could, people would just come forward and say, I've got this idea, let's do this, and they'd film it or record the audio. And then they stuck the tape in a box somewhere. So now when it comes around to people saying, oh, we'd like to do this program about what Bowie did in 1972, they say, well, that's great, but you're going to have to pay for it. And you're right, some of that stuff is big money. And the bigger the organizations, as you say, the Olympics, the NFL, um, all those sort of people, then it, it, uh, it, it's very expensive. So it becomes very restrictive for projects. That's right. Ideas are cheap. Making them happen is the hard <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's 20,000 US dollars for 30 seconds is very, very restrictive. You can't make much of a TV doc. You can't make an hour documentary based around 30 seconds, even if you could afford the 20 grand. <laughs> well, it was funny, actually, because I was talking to a, a filmmaker friend yesterday, and um, he watched an Elvis Presley documentary that was on Australian TV. He said it was, really, it was quite fascinating because all the interviews were Springsteen, Tom Petty, Bob Dylan. All of it was audio. They had no video footage of them at all. It was all audio interviews. And they just must have spent all their money getting 
as much material as they could, any videos or photographs or anything at all of us, and that's where they spent all the money. I know a lot about that project because I was involved in it because it's exactly what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Uh, there's, a, there's a big argument going, big di discourse between film producers. My argument has always been that these days you don't need to see a person talking. So, for example, the best one was The, the Rolling Stones. Uh, they did a fantastic film and decided that they didn't want to spend the time sitting in front of a camera. They would go into a studio and do it. And so they just did audio and matched it up, and it worked extremely well. And other films have been done. The same thing happened on a Marlon Brando film. The same thing happened uh, with, uh, there was, there's about four or five of them, Oasis. I don't know if you saw also the Amy Winehouse one. Exactly the same thing happened. They used radio audio. And Tom Zimney, who directed that Elvis one, and I had this long discussion. Tom has all the archive of Bruce, and we worked very closely with him on the Bruce Springsteen film. And he was working on the Elvis one at the time. And um, some of the audio that I had recorded over the years for Elvis projects was used in that film because we both agreed that you don't need to see people on camera. There are others, other filmmakers who disagree and say, no, I want to see their eyes. I don't care if they're now 70 or they're 80. I just want to see the expressions in their faces as they're talking. I'm of the view that you don't have to, because, probably because my radio is back, well, my background is radio. I don't think you have to. So I love the fact that people are making films recently where you're just using audio and that Elvis one was an example, as I said, the Amy Winehouse, the Oasis one, very, very similar. Uh, and uh, we're, I'm working on a few now that uh, just that, where you can sit down. It's much easier to get someone to participate if you say to them, I don't have to bring a film crew with lighting and makeup and everything else. It's just one microphone. They're much quicker to say yes in that scenario than if you say, I've got to bring up all that. It takes an hour with a film crew just to set up. So you'll find more and more of those are happening for two reasons. Firstly, creatively, it works better because you're, using the, you're matching them with their archive shots um, and also budget wise. But when you watch Crossfire Hurricane and things like that, you, you, you do have listen to what they're saying and it matched with their voices, it matched the voices with their images at the time, and I think works better than watching an aged rock star. Um, and they're all very vain. They don't want to be sitting there when they're 75 in front of a camera looking at photographs of when they're in their pomp and prime when they were 25 um, and talking about those glory days. So yeah, you'll find that happening a lot more. Because, well, the fact is that we, it doesn't affect us because we still look exactly the same as we did when we were 25. Of course, just as debonair. Beauty. Beauty. <laughs> but also, there's also access to material out there. There's a lot of archive around from those days um, that, that works very well. And, and I am working on a couple of projects I did were just using no presenter, just audio. So I did one with David Bowie, one on John Lennon. Uh, the Springsteen film was called just Bruce Springsteen in his own words for that very reason. There wasn't a presenter. So it's much easier to create a program. You use that audio as a basis and then match the images to it. So there's quite a few projects that I'm working on in that, in that same vein. So you get all the Bowie audio that you've pieced together over the years and then match it to, to the imagery. So you don't have to obviously see him on screen or just hear him. What do you prefer doing? Tell you or, or radio? Radio is much easier. You find a lot of people say that because you don't need all the mucking about that goes goes on with doing film. For example, with Springsteen, when we were doing his interview, there were 20 people involved because you've got to have, obviously, your lighting, your sound, your makeup, your, your director, cameraman, all these two or three cameras running around. With radio, you're walking with one microphone and that's it. <laughs> so it's much, much easier. And also, it's easy to get people to say yes for that very reason because as soon as you say it's for radio, it's one microphone, we can do this in half an hour. It's much better than saying, I'm sorry, we need five days to film you doing this and that and follow, follow you around and do the other bits and pieces. So it's, it's a lot more intrusive. So it's much easier. Television is fascinating. The product, the end product is still very rewarding. It's fantastic to see, but radio is much easier. It's just that the budgets aren't there, so you don't make any money out of it. No, but I mean, <laughs> As you but, know, I, I need to yes. tell you that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but, um, but what do you actually prefer to do? What, what do you find more interesting, making a TV show or making a radio documentary? They're both different in a way because you find that radio is in many ways a lot more interesting because you get people to open up more because it is just them and a microphone and they feel a lot more able to discuss things with you and they don't feel like they're threatened. Whereas when you've got a camera stuck in your face and a, as I say, the lighting guy standing a couple of feet away from you and then a second camera over their shoulder, they tend not to open up as much. So I find that the result, the material you get, if you're looking to find out more about the inner machinations of these people and why they do what they do, I think radio is a bit more rewarding in that respect. Yeah, look, I would agree with you 100% because I do know if you're sitting in a room and there is no indication of anything being recorded, you know, people just relax and 
It does. And when you go back through archive stuff, especially those that are no longer with us, like John Lennon, you go through the, the last couple of years where he preferred to do radio interviews because they could just sit in the studio, roll tape, and off they went. Uh, he was a lot more open than, than he tended to be when he was in a TV studio and felt that he was very much the public persona John Lennon, not the private John Lennon. And it happens a lot when you go back and listen to Bowie stuff as well and others. So do you own the, all the material? Some I do, some I don't. So, for example, some people, Springsteen, for example, said, we'll license you all the material and then the rights revert back to, to him through his production, production company. Others, if we work with them in partnership, we'll do a share, and others, they just it's very much the same way the photographers will work. They say, that's your material. Uh, you can do with it what you want. So in most cases, once the audio has been done, that's the easiest part. So there are, I've got an archive of interviews going way back 20, 30 years. In fact, I found one the other day uh, that was uh, from Perth when Joe Walsh came in during his <laughs> fantastic <laughs> The party period. boys. The party boy when he came in and did, and did an interview in the studio, which was riveting because he was high as a kite at the time. So that stuff is, is, is actually mine, yeah. Uh, I do remember Joe Walls coming to Australia. He joined the party boys for a while. <laughs> and, uh, and I interviewed him. I, did a, I was doing a radio show at the time called Jukebox Jury. But we'd sort of choke, play a few records and they had to, you know, give their opinion on these new releases. And it was him and Greedy Smith. What a, <laughs> what a wacky combination wow, what that a mix. was. Yeah. <laughs> it, but uh, it was sensational. It worked really well. <laughs> and Joe, wow, he, you're right, he was, he was off somewhere else. In that, at that time, he was on another planet, as he will openly admit. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't know what the planet was, and I don't really think <laughs> nope. I'd like to visit, but uh, it, was, it was interesting to watch. Only if you could be guaranteed to get a return ticket. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's yeah, called... Well, there's no guarantees. I think it's called Planet Because I Can. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called Planet Rehab. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So what's it, can you describe the, the studio setup you've got in London? Is it like a... It's, the, the good thing about it is that we have, at Zinc Media, we've got 25 studios and 24 of those are for TV editing and then the 25th one is the radio edit. So it's just a very small studio. We use a system called Sadie over here. So we've got the Sadie computer in situ there, a couple of speakers and a whole bunch of archive. And so it's just, it's just at the end of a row of, of, of editing suites. And it's a very, very tiny but very well insulated space. And it is the home where all of these radio guys work and where Chris does most of his editing work. So that's just like his second home. And we use a very old system of Sadie because some of the newer ones, the updates, are a little a bit unstable and they keep crashing on some of the modern technologies. So we've got a very, very ancient version on a very old computer that we've moved from studio to studio over the last 20 years and touch wood, it's still working. The only time it stopped working was a couple of years ago when one of the buildings sprung a leak and the, the flooded and everything was drowned. The oh, technicians no. at Sadie, Oops, Sadie did a very, very good job of, of basically saving everything, rebuilding it, and it's worked beautifully ever since. So, Do you know what Sadie is, Robbo? I do. A lot, the Poms love Sadie. I know, I've heard of a lot of radio stations in the UK who use Sadie, but um, I haven't personally even seen it, let alone used it. But, yeah, I have yeah, heard of still, Sadie. It's still the most used one. Still yeah, the most yeah used it's one. big over there. Yeah. It's it kind of like it's like a Pro Tools. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a workstation. It's a it's a door digital audio workstation. Um, having not seen it, I can't explain it. But yeah, I, I I understand there are a lot of advantages for live broadcast. Des, is that right? I remember yep. a, a couple of years ago. I think I seem to recall someone telling me that they were getting they were taking a, a a live broadcast and recording it into Sadie, but at the same time they were they were able to edit it on the fly. So as it's recording in, they were able to edit it. Am I wrong in saying that? I seem to recall that conversation, and, and I think that was yeah, one right. of its strengths. But it is good because it has been around for a long time. The company knows everybody in the industry, so they get lots of feedback. And there are alternatives. Other people are using others these days, especially when it comes to editing on laptops. But Sadie is the one that most, most people are using, and mm. most of the editors that we work with and I, I know of are, are using Sadie still. So do you ever, I know you were back in recently, back in, in Perth, but you ever have thoughts of coming back to Australia or are you uh, well and truly settled in the UK now? No thoughts at the moment, no. Um, having a great time over here. And the good thing is access. I don't think that you could make the sort of programs that we make um, in Australia because just the access would be too prohibitive. Even if you could get agreement to do them, getting from Australia to America, for example, to record with Springsteen would be really expensive. And I don't know that you'd get it in the first place. So things like that, just, just the fact that we can work with some amazing names over here, uh, it makes it very exciting. So no plans at this stage, no. Nice place to retire, though. Denmark would be cool. Sitting down there and um, fishing and surfing and doing nothing would be great. Mate, I, oh, you mean Denmark in WA? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought you meant Denmark up, as in Scandinavia. No no. no, no, Denmark down the south coast of WA. I was going to say, you wouldn't be doing much surfing in Denmark. <laughs> 
<laughs> in, in Scandinavia. But, um, well, you could, I suppose. But anyway, yeah, who knows? It is very exciting and there's, there's lots of interesting things happening. And the, the good thing about it is the technology now means that you can do a lot more portably. There are a lot of opportunities to do things, whether it's carrying around phones. People know that uh, podcasts at the moment uh, are the way of the future. A lot of people have been talking about how radio is in trouble. Basically, audio is the future. It doesn't matter what the platform is. You, you can do anything. So with a phone, you can wander around and make some great programs, whether it's music-based or not. The only re- prohibiting factor with music is obviously the licensing, but you can get around doing some fascinating exploratory projects using just a phone walking around and then going back onto your laptop and putting them together on as you guys know so that's very exciting for the future of audio not necessarily for commercial radio i think that's going to be a struggle for a while but podcasting gives you enormous potential to do all sorts of amazing things so it's just t- taking the basics that people have been doing for years but instead of having to carry around that reel-to-reel tape machine and then forgetting to push record it's just walking around with a phone in your pocket and recording anything you like and there are some amazing projects online that you hear people do Doing around the world and the good thing about it is that everyone could act, can get access to it in the old days where you're just restricted to a certain market these days the whole world is open to you so it's it is quite amazing scary and yeah. amazing in let, equal measure let me ask you this just as we as a closer thinking about the future um do you I mean, and this is something i've thought about a bit do you have, having a radio background obviously that you've got do you I, I, for me i see the future of radio is is they're actually going to have to move away from a uh, from 40 minutes of non-stop music and get back into more of a program-based thing, this stuff that you're producing. Very much so. For radio to survive, it's going to be tough in the future. I don't know anybody under the age of 30 who listens to commercial radio anymore. Um, they all have access to stuff online. So right from the very first moment of the day, they're listening to stuff online or stuff they've already saved. Podcasts are huge. So you can listen to anything anywhere. So to try and get an audience into the habit of listening to something. It can't be 40 minutes of nonstop music. Those, those days are long gone. And your content has always been the case. Your content is king. So whatever you can do to then give it life outside the speakers is important as well because it's not just listening in real time anymore. People time shift everything, television and radio, because, as you know, you can just get access to anything. So I think, as we all know, those big days in radio back in the 80s and 90s where people were writing millions of dollars a week in advertising revenue, as we all know, are long gone. So the only way that radio can survive in the future in in this very fractured market is to identify what they want to do, make sure they've got the right people in place, and then do it very cheaply because you can't keep affording to pay your presenters uh, and all your staff massive amounts of money when you haven't got the revenue coming in. So for commercial radio, it's it's going to be a big big struggle. Uh, And they have to make sure that it's multidimensional, it's multimedia, you can can no longer just do what you're doing on air. And and as you know, you look around the internet, the guys that are doing it best internationally are those guys who have got the studio set up. So you're basically creating radio with pictures and then disseminating that in short, sharp capsules so they can get the best bits online at any point. Yeah, those, those days of stations playing long sweeps of music, that's now over to people like Spotify. You don't need to listen to the radio anymore to get that stuff. Well, I guess time will tell, but I reckon, uh, I reckon you're pretty close to the money there. The next couple of years are going to be really interesting. And, and I know when you look at the ratings, radio is just declining continually, um, small sections at a time, but uh, the actual numbers of people listening to live radio and the, age, the demographic is getting older. So it's a real struggle for people who are targeting, and I don't know anybody that does anymore, the old days where you were targeting 18 to 24s because there was good revenue there, revenue potential there. Those days are gone because, as I mentioned before, everyone under the age of 30 is, is not listening to real-time radio. They're listening to stuff online from all around the world. So trying to get a local market dominance is going to be very, very difficult, especially as your, your audience ages and the younger people coming online. The big challenge for radio, doesn't matter whether it's commercial or non-commercial, is attracting a younger audience. Their attention spans are shorter, their options are much more varied, and it's a lot more difficult to get them to, to become regular creatures of habit. Yeah. So yeah, fascinating times, but I wouldn't want to be someone who's sitting there controlling the, the finances of a commercial radio station at this point in time. Oh, no. That's a tough gig. No, no, no. No, 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 I wouldn't want to be there. But, well, it's interesting. But, but the opposite well, is that the, the potential for, for people to go and do their own thing is immense. As I said before, you can just carry your phone around and a laptop and go and create your own radio yeah, world. Absolutely. I mean, the fact is we wouldn't be having this conversation if, if we were back in the old days because um, 
Not that anyone listens to us anyway, but... Uh, yeah. but <laughs> and would, in the old days, you wouldn't have been in a state to record it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a quick, short talk break. Uh, too that's long. It, absolutely. I think, I think we need to do it. You need to do a podcast where all the names are changed to protect the innocent, but just the stories of the old days of things that happened in the, oh, the AAA boardroom Jesus. in Sydney, for example. Can you imagine oh, the, the trouble uh, we could get into? <laughs> imagine. <laughs> there was, there's a great book there. There's a fascinating book there for someone to sit down and write all those stories down from Doug Murray onwards. Who's all brave enough to do it, happened. though? <laughs> well, I reckon, though. Well, you'd have to change the names. Ask Gracie. Get Gracie on the phone and ask him. Yeah, but I do remember there was a certain person who came in with a chainsaw and cut the boardroom table in half. Really? Yep. It must yes, have been before my time. That. I don't remember that. No. It was before your time, but I remember that. Wow. I remember that well. Wow. Yes. I guess. <laughs> I was threatened with a gun. Someone came in with a gun and said, if you give me another Eric Clapton song to play, I'm going to shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, oh. came, back, came, came back from an American holiday with uh, his head shaved and smuggled a gun back through. Oh, I know. <laughs> God. You know exactly who this is, Robbo. <laughs> yeah, I know who it is now. <laughs> but we won't mention the name, but he, uh, he'll be listening. I know he listens. Yeah, <laughs> right. Slapped the gun on the desk and said, give me Eric Clapton again or I'm going to use it. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun and games. So there's a podcast for the future. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah when it'll, they're all dead. It'll be cool. <laughs> yeah, it'll, no, it'll just be called The Names Have Been Changed to Protect the Innocent because... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think you get a lot of people to participate. I think you'd be fine that people would be willing to sit down in front of a microphone with a bottle of red and talk about the old days. You could actually dramatise it and just do it like drop the dead donkey. <laughs> you could. <laughs> That'd be really funny. But it's all real. How do you reckon? Was, you, have to make sure, you have to make sure that all the stories are genuine. So, right, this is the whole idea of this is that every single one of these stories is true and the names have been changed. But here we go. Because yeah. I think that the truth was far weirder. Uh, than fiction back in those days. I wonder if Southern Cross Australia would bankroll that for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, nope. Yeah, absolutely. The only people who'd listen would be three people, but it'd be bloody funny. Oh, yes, that's right, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'd laugh. We'd laugh at ourselves, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the number of research sessions I've been in recently, especially where when people are talking to the younger generation, when they hear about Woodstock, for example, we're doing a project for Woodstock's 50th anniversary next year, and there's this fantastic aura about Woodstock because it was the first of its kind. It's over the years, this reputation for being this free loving has just grown, and the music was awesome. But back in those days, music meant everything. Everybody's life revolved around the music, and Woodstock was so successful because of that you don't get that anymore so people look back with great envy because it was the love the freedom the music there were no problems with the drugs there was no aids all that sort of stuff so so the people love that hippie myth because of everything that it represents because these days it's not like that there are so many stresses for young people growing up and they, they don't see any great future whereas back in those days the hippies didn't care so there is anything of the past that is legendary and has built this fantastic reputation is very evocative and a very attractive to a young audience that don't know about it, but they're, they're keen to, to try and understand what happened at the time and why these things were so successful, the political situation at the time, what it led to, especially at the moment with this, the whole gender issue and the feminism issue, they were started to break ground 50 years ago. So those things are the same. Anything that is legendary from the past, has the reputation has grown because people talk about it and think about it and reminisce so lovingly in what was before, but it obviously can't ever be recreated. But, but that's why those things are successful, because they live on in people's dream. Now, Good is it fun. raining? Anytime. Is it raining? It's can't you hear it in the background? There's thunderstorms. It's absolutely pissing down. It's, yeah, I could hear it. I didn't know who yep. it was. It's you. Yep. Oh, no, okay. it's, that's what it is. No, it's the weather. It's the middle of at the end of May, the middle of summer. So what happens is you get glorious days of sunshine, and that brings in all the rain. And every couple of days it rains, so it's absolutely pelting down. So a fun drive on the M2 to London today ensures probably be a couple of hours sitting there in a tailback. Love it. Lucky all you. All right. Enjoy your day. Uh, well, there you go. That's Des Shaw and. Um, Interesting stuff about the uh, the Beatles re-record with um, the who's who of the industry. And I, the bit I found interesting was the um, the desk that uh, Oasis wanted to record on had to be shipped out of Lenny Kravitz's studio to yes. London oh, so that, they could right. record. <laughs> the EMT 1254 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. That'd be the one. Yeah. yeah. Those, are, that, those are made by EMI themselves. Yeah. That's right. That's why they wanted it. Yep. Yeah. And uh, amazing bit of kit that was. And then there was can, an interesting story. Can you story. imagine some of the conversations that went on with, you know, bands who are used to having Pro Tools or, or similar and having, you know, unlimited track counts. And then they turned around and they're told, well, you've got six. 
Yeah. <laughs> I I always Dude. thought this would be a feature. I, I wanted to write a piece of software that would basically make it so that if you tried to punch in, it would erase what you did previously. It would only give you eight, 16, or 24 tracks. And you had to basically make decisions and move forward. And you didn't get to record a part 100,000 times yeah. and then end up using take one. Yeah. You could call it tape. Yeah. yeah that's exactly. Right. Get on with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Put the pencil make away a and just make and a decision. Move on. Yeah. 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 But because uh, Richard Lush, who was one of the engineers, he we interviewed him, oh, God, about three years ago. He lives in Sydney these days and he was talking about that project. But it was amazing. A whole different uh, way you know, of thinking. The, 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 like the day in the life of um, a Beatles day at EMI in London was, it was kind of pedestrian in the way it was all set up you know the engineers would go out set up the drum kit in the corner get everything ready to go then in came the guys you know Paul would play his songs he had written on the piano and John would play his on guitar and then they'd make a decision and which ones they're going to record and boom off they went yeah I mean it's funny how back in the day things were a lot more cut up and as far as whose job was who I had a I have a friend who uh, back in the day worked at the record plant in um, in New York and, you know, the, the word tape operator, where does that come from? And there was a union position of a guy who ran the tape deck. And it used to be in the, you know, 50s and 60s, when they were doing a punch-in, the producer would call it to the tape operator. And then he, that's the guy who would press the button to go into record. <laughs> Talking of tape operators. Which now seems like something that's like, you got to do it now. Like, I don't need to tell you to do that. That's going to delay the process. There's a great story uh, from Richard Lush, actually, which I'd forgotten about, and someone reminded me yesterday. It was when they were doing the live satellite, All You Need Is Love, and the OB truck communication went down, and Richard, his job was to uh, queue up the backing tape, because they obviously performed to a backing tape, and he had miscued it. And he fired it, and it, <laughs> it was already a couple oh, of no. few seconds in. So he had, all you hear is like he he rewound quickly back to the the cue point, and that you if you listen if you ever see the the satellite broadcast you'll hear George Martin in the beginning saying, "Are you ready, Richard?" And because <laughs> Richard's like where you're going, shit, I'm rewinding the tape <laughs> to the right spot. We're going live to the world by satellite, and he miscued the tape. Whoa. Whoops. No pressure. Yeah. 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 No pressure. Absolutely. Talk about recording. On the next show, we'll be talking to uh, a chap from Philadelphia, your neck of the woods, George, uh, a guy called Eric Bazilian from The Hooters, who you may remember. And that's next time, then. That's next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know. Be tickled to death to go. Don't cry, don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin chin, na hoo toodle goodbye.